Greetings class, Professor Steve here, and uh, this should be the final lesson in the primary production slash phytoplankton in the ocean uh, unit. Um, and essentially this one is to um, basically describe why uh, they have such a high impact, phytoplankton that is. So, so why is it that microscopic organisms um, doing the same job that, um, you know, a 200, 100 to 150 200 even foot tree or all the other large land plants on earth well how is it that they can compare with them um, it's estimated that anywhere between 50 and 75 percent of uh, global oxygen atmospheric oxygen comes from ocean photosynthesis so how is it that the, these microbes can can manage to compete with with all of the land plast plants um, and there's there's three very very simple answers to that and first is the phytoplankton have very high reproductive rates. Um, a tree takes approximately, you know, 50 to 100 years maybe to mature, become an adult tree. Um, and even after that tree grows, it will it will continue to photosynthesize, but it does its maximum photosynthesis while it's growing. Um, but then for that tree to actually, for the carbon that went into making that tree, um, to be recycled, that tree has to die, um, sort of fall to the ground, rot, become nutrients that go into the ground and feed the next generation of trees. And so you ask yourself, what's the life, what, what is the lifetime, what's the generation time, or the, the life cycle of a tree? So if it takes about a hundred years for one to, to become full size, um, it doesn't die right away, but could live anywhere from a hundred 200, 300, 500, for many, many hundreds of years um, before it'll ever die, be recycled, and feed the next generation of trees. And it's that turnover of biomass, it's that uh, conversion of CO2 into that biomass is where the bulk of primary production comes from. So if we, for the lifespan of the tree, or at least its growth, growing span, takes up as much carbon as it possibly can, and then comes to a bare minimum uh, primary producti productivity rate, um, uh, because it doesn't die and rot right away and, and, and feed the next generation of trees right away. It's not the same thing with phytoplankton. Phytoplankton, their generation times are hours to days. Um, anywhere from a couple of hours to a day or a couple of days, um, every single phytoplankton reproduces. Um, now what's the generation time, so when do they die and turn over? Um, not quite sure. It's, just, it's, on, it's at the same rate, it depends on, on the environmental conditions, but it's definitely uh, on the order of days to a week and not hundreds of years. So that so phytoplankton reproduce like crazy, they're photosynthesizing the whole time, their population uh, grows exponentially, um, which leads us to, but they can also die and turn over, uh, become essentially nutrients for the next generation of phytoplankton. And so this continual turnover of carbon um, creates a very high output for primary productivity. And the high reproductive rates also leads to what is essentially the second reason, which is they're in very high abundance to begin with. Um, we call that their standing stock. So even when they're not growing, the, the number of phytoplankton that are in place that are floating around in their in their respective environments is very high. We said that at any given moment the estimate for the number of cyanobacteria alone is 10 to the 24th cells. Now these guys are tiny, uh, but when you have 10 to the 24th of them, um, collectively they're doing an awful lot of uh, primary productivity. So with, with very high abundance to begin with, so very high standing stock, original population, then all of a sudden nutrients come pouring in or environmental conditions become uh, such that they can grow at very, very high reproductive rates. Um, this makes for a recipe that, that just has an outstanding output, um, annual output of global primary productivity. So total across the global oceans over the entire year is what really matches up to, to um, terrestrial or land plants. Um, and the other thing that makes them very good at doing both these things is the fact that they're very small. They're small in size. Single-celled, um, um, the smaller in size an organism is, the higher its um, 
surface area, so the, the surface area surrounding the outside of that organism, to, to a volume ratio. So its surface area is very high compared to its total volume. Um, and what this does is allow them to absorb nutrients um, even in the ocean when the nutrients are very very low they're still very good at absorbing these nutrients and what that does is allow them to continue to grow so it's really these are the three main ones there are other reasons but these are the three main reasons that they're able to grow at such a high pace maintain such very high abundances um, and uh, annually and, and, and globally produce um, uh, a lot of oxygen and fix a lot of carbon. So what do they need? Uh, well we talked about their ability to take up nutrients. Uh, what else is needed for them to be able to do what they do and that is each and every nutrient obviously necessary. Um, we've talked about nitrogen quite a few times. Uh, I think we've thrown phosphorus out there but nitrogen in its bioavailable forms is important to, to note so it has to be nitrite, nitrate, or ammonia. Some organisms can take up one, two, or three of these better than, than others can which makes them a better competitor but they still need them and they need to be able to build these macromolecules for cellular growth and energy, right? Amino acids, proteins, and, and, and for energy molecules. Uh, phosphorus, same thing, it's important in structural um, uh, components within the cell um, for some some types of energy molecules, um, but more but more specifically for the genetic material, phosphorus is the backbone is part of the backbone um, of of organisms' genetic material, which is the DNA and RNA. So these are all necessary for growth and and reproduction. Um, and then there are some others, some specific to 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 certain species or groups. Um, such as um, another big one is silica, right? Silicic acid, um, uh, the silicate molecule. Uh, this is what diatoms need to create their cell structures and exoskeletons. And so at that in that rate, I could put up here uh, calcium, which is necessary for for coccoliths or coccolithophores or, or other th other things necessary for making their cellular structure, exoskeletons or those armor plates we've talked about. There are a whole slew of other important ones. Um, they can be very different for each species, but but another big one is iron. Iron plays an important role in in the um, in the cell's photosystems, which which are what have the photopigments in them, which allow them to do photosystem. Iron plays a big port an important role in in transferring uh, energy through that system. It's very complex and detailed, but but um and we don't need to know the, the details, but, but it's necessary for photosynthesis as a whole. But iron is also required for um, nitrogen fixation, which gives us these products up here. And we talked about that uh, with, with trichodesmia, and there's a bunch of bacteria that also do nitrogen fixation, um, non-photosynthesizing bacteria. Uh, and, and so without iron, this process can't happen. It's the only way nitrogen can be fixed is through this biological process and without iron it doesn't happen. Um, so how do we know uh, how much primary productivity goes on with these guys? Well we measure it um, and so what we do is find a method where we can measure gross production which is the total carbon fixation that occurs by the to, to these guys or I should say um, by these guys so how much inorganic carbon is fixed um, during um, inorganic carbon into organic carbon is fixed um, and then if we can measure the losses so the energy spent or the wastes created uh, during that process and subtract it from the gross we get the net production um, and so net the net production equals the gross production typically we just use a respiration term so even though uh, phytoplankton and all plants um, photosynthesize, they still have to burn some of the energy they make to maintain their their cells, to um, reproduce, they have to burn stuff, and in order to do that they have to do forms of respiration. So if we we can measure that term and and subtract it from the gross production, we have a, a pretty fair uh, measurement of what, what primary production is. One of the ways we do this, um, or at least a classical way that it's been done, is in what we call a light bottle, dark bottle incubation. So we take some, photo, some phytoplankton, we throw them in, a, in, in two bottles with similar sets of nutrients, um, and then what we do is we shade one. We cover it so that there's no light. Without the light, there's no photosynthesis in this one, 
but there is still respiration. So these guys continue to burn energy, but they don't photosynthesize. In the bottle with the light, they photosynthesize, but they're also burning that energy, right? So what we do is measure something about these two bottles, we'll talk about it in a minute, um, and we could subtract what we measure in here, where there's no photosynthesis from what we measure in here, and get gross primary productivity. And so, how do we do those measurements? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Um, some that aren't measured, that aren't that I did not list on here. Actually, I'll go back to here for that. Some that I didn't measure on he in here is well, what do, what do we know about photosynthesis? We know it consumes carbon. So, if you can measure carbon consumption somehow, it consumes CO2. If you can measure that, um, we know that it during photosynthesis we produce oxygen, right? Um, and so if we can measure either of those two things, we have essentially what we call a proxy or something where we can estimate um, how much photosynthesis and respiration went on in there. Uh, but another way we could follow it is what, through what we call radiometric assays, but also stable. So radiometric usually means uh, radioactive, and so these are... Um, um, uncommon isotopes of carbon. The, the, the common isotope of carbon is, is 12C, is C12 carbon, and the common one for nitrogen is N14. So if we make some uncommon ones like 14C or 15N and, and we label specific compounds that these guys might take up, um, then we can use a special measurement tool to measure the radioactive Act, the, the radioactivity of, of the cells um, that have taken these up and, and get sort of a, a measure for primary productivity. But with increases in technology we get even bigger and better ways to do that and that's such as satellite uh, imagery. So we can now use satellites to um, essentially measure by doing calculations with light absorption and, and, and the light spectra as it hits and bounces off our oceans, we can take pictures of that and through some very fancy calculations say we have this much chlorophyll going on here right now, this much chlorophyll right here, and this much chlorophyll here, or some other pigment or some other measurement of, the, of primary productivity. And so through satellites, at least in the surface or, or within a certain depth of the ocean, we can measure how much primary productivity is going on there, or at least get an estimate. Um, so the downside of that is it is really only the surface, the parts that the satellite can see. Uh, it doesn't measure primary productivity but below a certain depth in the ocean. But when we put all these tools together, every, all the scientists measure their, their own different parts, they put all these tools together, um, they get a, um, a rough measurement. Essentially we can add all these things up and input them into mathematical models and come up with global estimates of annual both changes and total uh, photosynthesis. So if you watch this we have these large stretches of ocean along the coast, along these certain parts of the ocean in the, in the middle, in the North, North Atlantic, and we'll go over these in great detail and why they happen, when they happen, and why they happen uh, in another lecture. But um, but you can see how things flare up into these gigantic blooms and then fade away. Much of it's seasonal. Some things are more persistent, but uh, we get quite a good picture from that. So what else controls primary productivity? Um, or Well, we went over what's necessary for it, but what controls it? Obviously the light availability. Um, if we're doing photosynthesis, we need light to do photosynthesis. And you don't need to um, reproduce this equation, but it's known as lambert beers Law. And essentially it describes this line, and that is that light is attenuated or is blocked more and more as we go deeper and deeper in the ocean, even by water molecules. They scatter the light, they make it less and less as it goes. But as we get particles, whether they're organisms or just junk floating around in there, um, in the ocean, we get more and more blockage, and so light decreases very quickly with depth. And so we have high light at the surface, low light at the bottom of what we call the euphotic zone and so less photosynthesis. Uh, what else controls it? The second thing, standing stock. If we have um, a large amount of pre-existing phytoplankton, when they reproduce, we can grow very quickly exponentially. If, if we start off with fewer phytoplankton, then the reproduction happens much, much more slowly. Uh, one of the things that could control that is the availability of nutrients. Um, we listed off the nutrients, right? So they need these, therefore they control. The phytoplankton need these, therefore it's part of what controls them. And uh, another thing is predation. 
um, predators come in here, eat these guys up, um, and so there's less of them to start with. Thanks for joining me. See you next le lesson.